good evening panelists and good evening good everyone evening. in the audience. Uh, and thanks for a wonderful evening today. Uh, the, the theme that we have today is on uh, tech powering the auto industry and we know this is an industry which contributes to more than 7 to 8 percent of the Indian economy so and much more in terms of uh, in employment that India relies on. So it's a significant sector, not just from an industry perspective, but also from a government perspective and a social infrastructure perspective. Uh, so tech is, uh, we believe, a, a very big disruptor in the industry, but we would like to hear from people who work in this industry on a day in day out basis to understand how it's changing the entire uh, industry itself. So if I may start with you, Prashant, uh, how do you think our automotive finger trends shaping the Indian automotive industry uh, and expected to be so in the next five to seven years. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Agawan. Uh, even before I answer this, you made a point that automotive contributes a bigger portion to the India's GDP. And if you look at uh, the GDP of India, about 16% is coming from manufacturing. Out of that, 49% is from automotive. And also in terms of the employment, it's almost 50%, about 20 million people are employed within the automotive. With that as a background, so I think uh, if you see uh, 10, 15 years back, uh, cars used to be purely mechanical. Then slowly we started adding electronics to that. With that electronics, they came in the software. But if you see last three, four years, I think there has been a huge increase in the content of electronics. And we all know that the connected assisted, safe, and electric mobility, I think. I think that speaking up, today, more than 50% of the decision is based on the new horsepower, that's the connected features. It's no more the engine capacity. So that's where it is going through. Again, if you see, we had a gap in the safety norms, and the uh, government of India really worked in bringing in regulations Bridging the gap of safety with the European norms. I think there we are in par with that, which is driven by regulations. But now, what's driving now is the consumer preferences. That's more of the connected and the assisted functions. So, there's a lot of thing which is going on in terms of the connected features. And as we speak, now already industry is now talking about software different way. Uh, that's the biggest challenge for automotive industry as a whole, because still we are not able to separate, maybe Balaji can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we have not mastered the separation of hardware and software. That's why you see there's huge development costs. And if I talk about uh, iPhone, they have done fantastically well. For example, today if uh, iOS 17.2 is running, it runs on multiple hardware, iPhone 11, 12, 13, 14. That's where the software defined vehicle could prove to be. So that's the next trend. And talking about electrification, I think it's a little bit of uh, catching up for India, where we see a, a trend, especially on the two wheelers, three wheelers, and commercial vehicles. Still, there's no business case when it comes to passenger cars. Still, it, we have a 30% premium compared to the heights. Yeah? So unless the battery prices comes down below maybe $75 per Kilowatt, then you see there is a business case vis a vis ice So the industry is catching up. And also, when you talk about electric vehicles, it's 40% is electrification, another 60% is coming from other software on the electronic portion of this. So that's huge, which is more connected and the assisted functions. Yeah, and Balaji, I think just because Prashant took your name, I'm going to come yeah. to you next. Uh, if you want to weigh in on what he said and also understand that Mercedes is doing a lot of things on incorporating tech into not just your manufacturing but also into the way customer experiences. So if you want to talk about how that's going to change in the Indian landscape today, it's Mercedes but it could trickle down into the mass segment of cars as well. So how do you see that progressing in the country? Yeah, uh, first of all, good evening to everyone and uh, super happy to be on the panel today. And uh, tech differentiator, you, know, you talked about, I think uh, Prashant already touched upon something like a software defined vehicle. Um, and like he said, I think uh, it just the last 100 plus years, it has moved from a mechanical to everything which is software defined. Um, and like you said, yes, it is difficult to decouple the hardware, the underlying mechatronics layer that we have to the software. Uh, 
but I, at, at most days I would say we were uh, right now able to uh, bring a certain level of abstraction. We call it as our chip to cloud architecture uh, where we are able to uh, bring that kind of an abstraction or a layering between the software and hardware and that allows us to say kind of continuously update the software over there. Right. So and uh, right now this was already shown in the reason not a show for example and we are launching it in this year. Uh, where we would have a lot of uh, software updates that are possible. It is not only covering uh, during the development, but also development during production, uh, even at the customer end. We are able to continuously offer software to keep things up to date. Like he mentioned about iPhone, just like how you would experience an iPhone where you get a new software update pushed to your mobile device uh, as and when a new update is available. Uh, to keep that kind of a continuous excitement for the customer, to keep things up to date, uh, and this is something what we are doing. Uh, but tech differentiator, if I have to look at it, uh, you know, it's very known that Mercedes for the iconic design, uh, but also what we want to, uh, what we have been doing is also on the technology, you know, in terms of the cutting edge technology. So if I have to talk about few things, so the Technology is like cutting across so many areas. Like if I talk about the interiors, the interiors of the car has become super intelligent. Uh, you know, the car is like now a spa, for example, uh, and I say car is like a spa, it can already figure out uh, what is the kind of your mood and uh, uh, body vitals and uh, then we can trigger the hot stone massage for you automatically. Uh, so that's a kind of a, a spa like experience what you can have. Uh, and this all, uh, I would say, enabled by technology. Or it can be like an office uh, where you can do your Teams call, for example, uh, uh, to have a you know video conference or get your office calendar scheduled or rescheduled. If it knows that you're running late for a certain destination, it can already predict that and figure out that, okay, that you're going to be late for the next meeting and it can ask the virtual assistant to already reschedule the meeting, uh, for example, right? So it is like an office. Uh, it, it is like a theater, for example, of course, a kind of an immersive entertainment that you have. Uh, it's no more that you have to go to a movie theater for a 70 mm, you know, on a 70 mm screen. Uh, you get the Dolby Atmos, Atmos, you know, experience inside the car, uh, the kind of uh, 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 surround navigation uh, and also the kind of coupled with that ambient lighting that you have, right? You, you can actually, uh, according to the sound, the light would also change automatically. So this is a kind of an immersive hyper personalized experience plus on top of it you get a like a virtual assistant on top you know which can talk in a natural language uh, we are talking about all the LLMs and so on inside that to make it look like more natural empathetic uh, and this is something what we are looking at from a if I have to simply look at an in-car experience uh, of course outside it is becoming more sustainable from an electric driving point of view autonomous driving point of view and I think at the end of the day, if you look at it, what is the underlying thing in this? It's the kind of a tech, right? Either it's on the electrification side, sustainability uh, elements of it, whether it's on the material science or even discovering material through quantum computing, for example, right? Or on the uh, autonomous driving with an embedded AI uh, or the in-car experience, what I just talked about. I would say uh, this is a kind of a breadth what you see and the kind of a technology uh, differentiators what uh, I would say this industry could bring in in terms of the customer experience. Um, yeah, I would take a pause there and of course, yeah, looking forward to the further conversation. Well, that's quite interesting. Uh, uh, coming to Nitin, uh, the organization that you work with, Tata Alexi, does a lot of work in the software side, uh, especially that goes into vehicles. So I think you would be the right person to answer this. Uh, traditionally, Indian companies have been focused on validation and testing of automotive software. But with the case taking center stage in the Indian context, uh, how do you see this evolving? And do you see the role of Indian companies, especially on the software side, taking a much more centered role in, uh, in global automotive ECUs and stacks which are, which are going into the vehicles, even that the proportion of electronics and software code which are being written for vehicles are just enormous these days? Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, the way I would look at it, Raghavan, is really along two, three layers, right? One is, uh, if I were to roll back 10, 15 years back and coming to the point that uh, both Prashant and uh, Balaji made, as long as cars were means of utility and electronics and software was not the dominant driver of experience, uh, you did not need India as much. 
you looked at India as possibly a manufacturing base and not nothing more. But the moment you look at a car and the point that's moving from a means of mobility to an experience by itself, which is then enabled by electronic and software, then you're talking of skills and scale required in software and electronics. And I think India is at a unique place right now where by virtue of the number of colleges that we have, the sheer population that we have, and the base of talent that has been developed, partly by companies like us uh, who have initiated engineering R&D, partly by, of course, companies like a Continental or a Mercedes-Benz, who set up captives here, but to serve not just as outposts, but as innovation hubs. I think we have raised the overall profile of what can be done. And I think it is also true that the amount and quantum of work that is necessary to be done further in terms of heavy lifting also means that there's not enough talent in Japan, Germany, US, or Eastern Europe, or anywhere else you look at hubs of talent. So to that extent, I think India is right now at a, in the, whatever you call a demographic dividend of engineering. Right? And the intersection of the need in automotive, in terms of heavy lifting that's needed in software, and the place where we are in terms of the availability of talent, and possibly the intent for innovation. I think they're at the right place. And Prashant, I think Continental also has a very strong uh, software presence in the country, especially in the automotive side. So do you want to add on to this uh, to entire question on how software is, how the Indian companies are taking to the global scale? Sure. Uh, today, if you look at the complexity of software, it's about 100 million lines of code, and that's going to be about 300 million lines of code in the next couple of years. Having said that, will you be measuring yourself by number of lines of code or you migrate to system, subsystem systems and the integration part of it. Yeah? So that's the challenge going forward. Number two, in terms of the opportunity, while it's a challenge, the total size of automotive industry globally is about 2.75 trillion. And that's projected to go up to 5.4 trillion by 2030. In the 2.5 trillion, the software portion is only just 300 billion today. That could go up to 1.5 trillion. Plus software as a service could go up to 300 billion. So that the 1.8 trillion worth of software is waiting in the next five, six years. So that's the opportunity for Indian company. I think as a country, we have done very well when it comes to uh, the IT services. But when it comes to uh, automotive, as a conventional companies, we are very good at specking, we are very good at uh, testing, and we have a philosophy that unless it's zero defect, we don't launch a product. But the philosophy on the software side is, you launch and I will fix it later. <laughs> so I think <laughs> both of us to come together, learn from each other, I'm sure there will be much more possibilities from that perspective. And uh, talking about Conti, we have a uh, tech center here, which is working on most of the uh, cutting edge technologies, be it via the autonomous mobility, or the high performance computing, or the user experience, the pillar to pillar displays what you see. Uh, uh, we continue to grow. And I think, uh, as Nathan was talking about, you need so many engineers. I don't think in developed countries you'll be able to get so many engineers. But I think that's a big opportunity for India as such for us to continue growing. Sure. Uh, and coming back to you, Balaji, uh, so do you think that EV is the only uh, platform that's going to survive in the Indian industry or do you see alternative uh, platforms also that's going to take shape? And Mercedes, I know that they have very few classes which have already come in, but do, do you see the future being limited to EVs and traditional ice or do you see alternative fuel options also coming? I would say it's a, it's a difficult question to answer because there's no one single answer to it. Uh, I, I would say it's a, at some level, I would say the pace of transformation, what is, what is happening, uh, both the customer and the market would dictate the pace of transformation, right? So I would say adoption of EVs will happen uh, in terms of sustainable mobility because everybody is thinking what is good for the whole world and so on. I think that's the general mindset shift, what you see. But I think the rate of adoption would determine uh, what would be the kind of uh, a mix of technologies that would exist at any point of time. And I would say from Mercedes point of view, we have an ambition 
uh, we call it as ambition 2039 where we say we have uh, we have said that on, by 2039 everything will be all electric including our supply chain uh, because we have received commitments from our own suppliers uh, including con for example to say commit to a carbon free uh, supply chain um, as well as uh, from our entire fleet uh, production operations are already carbon neutral since 2022 uh, but we know that a long term it is going to be a sustainable future with electric mobility. But I think until then, how would that whole technology coexist? And you talked about alternatives. Yeah, there are several alternatives like hydrogen, green hydrogen. There is a lot of discussions around that. Um, but from a car perspective, at least the segment that we kind of operate, uh, we are very clear that we would go with the battery electric. Uh, but from a personal opinion point of view as a technology of a green hydrogen, I would say uh, it is definitely more beneficial for a heavy duty segment uh, where it would be definitely more uh, helpful and that is my personal view uh, in terms of uh, alternate technology over there. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Nitin, if I may come back to you. Uh, ADAS is a very nascent topic in India. Uh, a lot of companies claim that they are going to do ADAS. But if you look at where India is, we're mostly in L1, barely scraping L1. Internationally, we have seen L3, R&D going on in L4 and L5. But you see the Indian customer ready to pay a premium for ADAS technologies beyond L1. And if so, where is that necessity coming out, getting grown out of? So there are two parts here, right? So when you talk of ADAS, uh, there is a certain assumption that, uh, that uh, that one makes as you design systems, which is that it's not just about what you put into the car, but the fact that the car M1 operates in an environment which is also regulated. For example, that you'll have roads, and the roads will be of a certain width and a certain size. You'll have curb markings, you'll have lane markings, and rules will be followed. And I think the difficulty is not in implementing technology. The Difficulty is in assuring that your technology will work where there are no rules or the infrastructure does not follow the rules. And I think that is the challenge that India has. So we have got systems, for example, we have been building some amount of autonomous vehicle technology for the last about nine years. 2014 is when we started. As far as highways went, it performs perfectly. You get to cities, works okay on certain roads. And then you get to smaller roads and so on, it just stops. And then the other problem of ADAS is also that when you go beyond pure feature based, right? Where you go beyond just warning and informing drivers to active assistance, there is a serious problem of uh, wherever there is a human touch. For example, I'll give you an example. Assume that there's a free turn. And now you get the car in a self driving mode to a free turn. You're completely dependent on the behavior on the other side to decide when you start turning. If, if a car had to be absolutely safe, it would never turn. In India, it will never turn. It will just wait there for the next two hours. Right? Why? Because you always find somebody is nosing in. Right? And this needs absolute clarity in terms of risk to make that turn freely. Right? So our view was that you need a passive aggressive behavior imparted on top of your radar system just to make sure that you can also be a little aggressive to turn. <laughs> so, OK, stepping back. The point I'm trying to make is, one, ADAS is difficult. ADAS is difficult in India simply because you expect that the infrastructure and the environment supports you as much as the technology inside the car does. Okay? Uh, that is not the only driver. Part two, features in India, in the context that we are in, large part of what would, what you would call as ADAS elsewhere does not apply. For example, I have tried Mercedes, I have tried BMW too, which I own now, and I have turned off most of the ADAS functions. Because all they do is beep. <laughs> and as far as I am concerned, we are not practical. I use Park Assist and so on and so forth, very, very specific use cases. The rest, what I would have assumed would have helped me is a traffic jam assist. I am in very, very slow crawling traffic. Don't worry about the road, lane marking, etc. Just keep a two feet distance. Don't keep more than two feet because somebody else will get you. Right? So you need very India specific, unique features and hopefully there is a case for ADAS there. Otherwise, in general, I think you can most likely use it only on highways or very highly regulated roads where what rules apply elsewhere apply there. So that's my simple view. I, I believe that's very well said, uh, Nathan, because all the time, whenever I get into an ADAS enabled car, the first thing that a driver does is switch off the switch off the ADAS systems. I think the way, if I may add, the way you have to look at ADAS is assisted, automated, and autonomous. 
I think what makes sense for India is assisted controls because this is an extension of safety. Uh, when you talk about automated, it's hands off and to some extent eyes off, but still we are not there. Well, there's a technology exists, as Nitin said, it's not only the vehicle technology, but the driving discipline, the road infrastructure, even the signboard infrastructure. So <laughs> many things have to come together. So from that perspective, there is a good traction up to L2, uh, maybe L2 plus in next three, four, five years, what you see. But when you have to be automated, it will certainly take some time. I think I can uh, just add a couple of more points. I think two other dimensions is also to prepare the uh, consumer behavior, right? Because if you, even if, you know, uh, experienced drivers, just they go and sit in an autonomous car, right? If you travel abroad, sit in a, or in a Mercedes level three autonomous, for example, sit in. I think first time when you experience it, you need to feel confident about that. I think uh, that is one. Uh, so there's a lot of consumer uh, customer education that is there. And also the communication to the external world. If you are sitting in an autonomous car, how would the other participants in the traffic would know that an autonomous car is flying on the road? And what kind of communication that you would have to the external world, right? So there are a few examples like you can have a different kind of headlamp uh, technology. You can communicate in a certain different way from an exterior of a car uh, or from a V2X kind of a communication. So this is also equally important for enabling the autonomous technology. When we move from assisted to automated to autonomous, uh, Prashant nicely put it. Uh, the third, the second is the regulatory aspect. So I think all the participants of the whole industry ecosystem have to come together to also work together to say the this is how the regulation uh, aspects also have to uh, uh, support such an introduction of a new technology. Sure. Uh, Prashant, if I may come to you, uh, how do you see the tier one ecosystem changing? I mean, we're talking about EVs, hybrids, we're talking about hydrogen, we're talking about ADAS a whole lot of things happening in the industry. So how do you see the, the tier ones scoping up for such technological disruptions which are happening across the board? Um, and what 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 is continent, I mean, not specific to continent, but how do you see the entire tier one ecosystem uh, adapting the, to these changes in the market? As far as electrification is concerned, I talked about here, yeah. when, when it comes to passenger car, it's going to take some time because still it's expensive. So I will say that markets like India, I think the, even before we move to 100% uh, EV, I think the best is to have partial hybrid or a plug-in hybrid. Unfortunately, government didn't support this for the last five years. Instead of moving to Euro 6, this would have been the best building technology. But there's a lot of consumer pull when it comes to uh, hybrid, some form of hybrid. I think that's true, number one. Number two, uh, when it comes to connected technologies, I think uh, uh, across the supply base there has been a good amount of uh, experience. This again from the multinationals being present here and also the local uh, tier ones in India. Either they have acquired uh, technology through uh, partnership or they've been able to do on their own. I think today we have a good uh, uh, base in terms of localizing this technology, including optical bonding for what you call this display, sir. Yeah. The only uh, thing is, this requires a lot of uh, semiconductors. Unfortunately, India is not the location. Every single active passive component, including resistor, is imported from some other part of the world. I think government has realized that, and they are also working. But it will take five, six, seven years time because that ecosystem doesn't exist today. But it will take some time for us to really get up when it comes to the semiconductors. Uh, as well. So, I think overall, if you see, there has been a good thing, and uh, this is the only industry where we are able to net off imports versus uh, uh, exports last year. I think now the new target given by Mr. Pirish Goyal is from 20 billion to 100 billion, and there have been a lot of actions which is currently underway to reach this 100 billion by 2030. So, I think it's a good opportunity, I would say, for the Indian supply base for us to really level up. Great. Uh, so if one last question, and if I can go around the panel, starting with you, Nitin, is uh, AI is a big theme, and I'm going to borrow this from the panel, which is parallelly running. AI is a big theme, which is the buzzword for in the industry, as well as anyone on the road, right? 
So how do you see AI disrupting the entire auto industry, if, if, if so to speak? I would look at it at uh, multiple levels, right? So one is what goes into the product. And if I assume that the car is the product, what goes into the product that allows it to be lifted from a utility to an experience, combined with safety and uh, comfort, convenience and more, right? And how does it integrate into the life of the consumer? And like Balaji said, how does it become your place of work? How does it become your home away from the home, right? So I think there is a whole aspect of what electronics and software can do and a layer of AI on top that provides for that fundamental experience and the integration of the experience. I think examples are bound right? uh, in terms of uh, whether it is the learning capability of the car to the paths that you drive, the music that you listen to, the typical driving pattern, the seat uh, seatings, uh, the settings that you have and so on. I think you can think of AI as being a learner that is sitting always and absorbing from that learning and making sure that the next time around almost like this magic journey, it's, it's, it's done it for you. Right? And I think that delivers an incremental experience. The next level is how is the product made? So if I'm going to manufacturing, I think there's a very, very large role for robotics and AI to bring in both efficiency and quality. Right? And I think that's going to be a critical element because as products become more complex, I think manufacturing is also becoming very complex. So the dependency on human and human errors and humans in the loop, I think you'll have to somehow remove. Not simply because of cost, because India is still not at the point where labor is such a big problem, but you're at a place where quality is so critical that you want humans out of the loop where it is not necessary. And then if I look at it further, you have AI coming in in the entire experience beyond just product itself and the manufacturing product. Sales, marketing, I think Mercedes-Benz is a fantastic uh, example of how they've transformed the whole retail experience, right? where they moved from this whole OEM to dealer, stocks at the dealer's place, dealer is the only point of contact to pulling it everything back. So technically at this time, in my view, Mercedes has a view of consumer right from the point of interest till the point of maybe recycling the vehicle. Right? I think that is the journey that you're taking, again, all augmented by AI. Right? I'm not saying AI is the only thing that makes it happen. Let me also be clear. Uh, AI is a learner that's sitting always on the top, listening, and therefore learning from it and therefore making sure that the next time around it's better. So I'll not say it's only AI, but I think AI is a great augmentation to everything that's happening right now. Prashant, do you want to add to that? Yeah, maybe Nitin talked about uh, the customer experience with the AI. Maybe I can give one example how it's really positively impacting on the shop floor. Uh, you know, when you manufacture all this hardware and everything is getting complicated. And one such example where we have implemented is on the AOI station, what we call magic AOI. Always when you do this in millions of pieces, there's always something called false spots. So how do you minimize the false spots? Because in the, when it comes to electronics, our policy is, if there's a defect, no rework, it goes to scrap. So if there's a false spot, then somebody has to inspect it in a 40X or something, then he decides, and there's always a possibility of error. Of it. Then how do you prevent these false calls in the uh, measuring uh, the station itself, there we have used the yeah. AI. So that's, that has really yielded us fantastic results in terms of reducing the pulse calls by more than 90%. And Balaji, if you want yeah, to give your I, I can add, I think both of them beautifully covered. I think, uh, yeah, I, I have, I, if I have to just summarize also some of them, what uh, they shared, I think it just covers the entire spectrum of the automotive the life cycle, development life cycle. Starting from design, you know, you can now uh, look at generative designs, for example, uh, that you can use with a Gen AI, for example. Yeah. And then if you go into the products, Nitin already talked about the AI, like for example, autonomous driving is a very typical example of, with a lot of embedded AI, which is already there. A AI deployed at the edge, for example, edge devices. Uh, customer experience, in-cabin experience, I think all of us shared some experience, for example. You know, if you go in a, in a Mercedes, in a German autobahn, you can, uh, it'll automatically detect the location and give you a kind of tour guide and telling historic uh, uh, landmarks that you can go and visit uh, and even give more details about it in a very natural language. Uh, the LLMs of it is actually integrated in that. Uh, now there is a chat GPT integration on a head unit. Uh, so I think as an in-cabin experience uh, has gone to a next level with the help of AI. Uh, to a level that 
you know whatever it's not whatever the customer needs it knows it knows what the customer needs when when the customer needs and how it has to be delivered and that is the kind of a hyper personalized immersive customer experience what you can bring and outside the car i think it's a kind of a connection with the app with the kind of a selling experience uh, or a retail experience or even you know even you want to uh, schedule an appointment at the service or solve a problem with the customer care center maybe there is a lot of ai over there as well uh, i think it's uh, going to be all pervasive so there is no one single way and of course uh, gen ai as a uh, offshoot at some level you know has also a lot more implementation right whether it's in the in all different touch points of the customer so i think this is a technology that is going to stay and it's going to uh, i would say uh, scale um, in and in terms of uh, uh, availability in different products uh, but what would also become more important and as the customer awareness is increasing a lot around the responsible use of ai uh, the ethics around it uh, the kind of regulations around it so more and more uh, countries are coming up with uh, Uh, regulatory aspects around AI, like a EU uh, in the European Union, there's a AI Data AI Act, for example. Uh, so these elements will also become important equally as the awareness is raising. Uh, and then we would also then move to a newer technology. I think that's a, a regular way of life. Yeah, move from an AI to a quantum AI, uh, and that is what would eventually happen. Okay. Uh, I think that was very well summarized, Balaji. And uh, thank you, gentlemen. On that note, uh, for a very very good panel. Uh, and if i may add i think the the one thing which came out across all the discussions was a car from a mechanical device is now moving into a mechatronics device plus a software device and that's going to provide challenges to the industry but also you on the other side of it you look at it as a bundle of opportunities that is going to that is going to come in for the industry to take care of uh not not again uh, thank you very much and it was a pleasure interacting with you thank you raghu thank you for